This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by J. A. Carter Orthodoxy by G. K. Chesterton Chapter 2 The Maniac Part 1 Thoroughly worldly people never understand even the world. They rely altogether on a few cynical maxims which are not true. Once I remember walking with a prosperous publisher, who made a remark which I had often heard before. It is indeed almost a motto of the modern world, yet I had heard it once too often, and I saw suddenly that there was nothing in it. The publisher said of somebody, That man will get on. He believes in himself. And I remember that as I lifted my head to listen, my eye caught an omnibus on which was written, Hanwell. I said to him, Shall I tell you where the men are who believe most in themselves? For I can tell you. I know of men who believe in themselves more colossally than Napoleon or Caesar. I know where flames the fixed star of certainty and success. I can guide you to the thrones of the supermen. The men who really believe in themselves are all in lunatic asylums. He said mildly that there were a good many men, after all, who believed in themselves and who were not in lunatic asylums. Yes, there are, I retorted, and you of all men ought to know them. That drunken poet, from whom you would not take a dreary tragedy, he believed in himself. That elderly minister, with an epic from whom you were hiding in a back room, he believed in himself. If you consulted your business experience instead of your ugly individualistic philosophy, you would know that believing in himself is one of the commonest signs of a rotter. Actors who can't act believe in themselves, and debtors who won't pay. It would be much truer to say that a man will certainly fail because he believes in himself. Complete self-confidence is not merely a sin. Complete self-confidence is a weakness. Believing utterly in oneself is a hysterical and superstitious belief, like believing in Joanna Southcote. The man who has it has Hanwell written on his face, as plain as it is written on that omnibus. And to all this, my friend, the publisher, made this very deep and effective reply. Well, if a man is not to believe in himself, in what is he to believe? After a long pause, I replied, I will go home and write a book in answer to that question. This is the book that I have written in answer to it. But I think this book may well start where our argument started, in the neighborhood of the madhouse. Modern masters of science are much impressed with the need of beginning all inquiry with a fact. The ancient masters of religion were quite equally impressed with that necessity. They began with the fact of sin, a fact as practical as potatoes. Whether or no man could be washed in miraculous waters, there was no doubt at any rate that he wanted washing. But certain religious leaders in London, not mere materialists, have begun in our day not to deny the highly disputable water, but to deny the indisputable dirt. Certain new theologians dispute original sin, which is the only part of Christian theology which can really be proved. Some followers of the Rev. R. J. Campbell, in their almost too fastidious spirituality, admit divine sinlessness, which they cannot see even in their dreams. But they essentially deny human sin, which they can see in the street. The strongest saints and the strongest skeptics alike took positive evil as the starting point of their argument. If it be true, as it certainly is, that a man can feel exquisite happiness in skinning a cat, then the religious philosopher can only draw one of two conclusions. He must either deny the existence of God, as all atheists do, or he must deny the present union between God and man, as all Christians do. The new theologians seem to think it a highly rationalistic solution to deny the cat. In this remarkable situation, it is plainly not now possible, with any hope of universal appeal, to start as our fathers did with the fact of sin. This very fact which was to them, and is to me, as plain as a pike staff, is the very fact that has been specially deluded or denied. But though moderns deny the existence of sin, I do not think that they have yet denied the existence of a lunatic asylum. We all agree still that there is a collapse of the intellect as unmistakable as a falling house. Men deny hell, but not as yet Hanwell. For the purpose of our primary argument, the one may very well stand where the other stood. 
I mean that as all thoughts and theories were once judged by whether they tended to make a man lose his soul, so for our present purpose all modern thoughts and theories may be judged by whether they tend to make a man lose his wits. It is true that some speak lightly and loosely of insanity as in itself attractive, but a moment's thought will show that if disease is beautiful, it is generally someone else's disease. A blind man may be picturesque, but it requires two eyes to see the picture. And similarly, even the wildest poetry of insanity can only be enjoyed by the sane. To the insane man, his insanity is quite prosaic, because it is quite true. A man who thinks himself a chicken is to himself as ordinary as a chicken. A man who thinks he is a bit of glass is to himself as dull as a bit of glass. It is the homogeneity of his mind which makes him dull, and which makes him mad. It is only because we see the irony of his idea that we think him even amusing. It is only because he does not see the irony of his idea that he is put in Hanwell at all. In short, oddities only strike ordinary people. Oddities do not strike odd people. This is why ordinary people have a much more exciting time, while odd people are always complaining of the dullness of life. This is also why the new novels die so quickly, and why the old fairy tales endure forever. The old fairy tale makes the hero a normal human boy. It is his adventures that are startling. They startle him because he is normal. But in the modern psychological novel, the hero is abnormal. The center is not central. Hence the fiercest adventures fail to affect him adequately, and the book is monotonous. You can make a story out of a hero among dragons, but not out of a dragon among dragons. The fairy tale discusses what a sane man will do in a mad world. The sober, realistic novel of today discusses what an essential lunatic will do in a dull world. Let us begin, then, with the madhouse. From this evil and fantastic inn, let us set forth on our intellectual journey. Now, if we are to glance at the philosophy of sanity, the first thing to do in the matter is to blot out one big and common mistake. There is a notion adrift everywhere that imagination, especially mystical imagination, is dangerous to men's mental balance. Poets are commonly spoken of as psychologically unreliable, and generally there is a vague association between wreathing laurels in your hair and sticking straws in it. Facts and history utterly contradict this view. Most of the very great poets have been not only sane, but extremely businesslike. And if Shakespeare ever really held horses, it was because he was much the safest man to hold them. Imagination does not breed insanity. Exactly what does breed insanity is reason. Poets do not go mad, but chess players do. Mathematicians go mad, and cashiers, but creative artists very seldom. I am not, as will be seen, in any sense attacking logic. I only say that this danger does seem to lie in logic, and not in imagination. Artistic paternity is as wholesome as physical paternity. Moreover, it is worthy of remark that when a poet really was morbid, it was commonly because he had some weak spot of rationality on his brain. Poe, for instance, really was morbid, not because he was poetical, but because he was specially analytical. Even chess was too poetical for him. He disliked chess because it was full of knights and castles, like a poem. He avowedly preferred the black discs of draughts because they were more like the mere black dots on a diagram. Perhaps the strongest case of all is this, that only one great English poet went mad, Cowper. And he was definitely driven mad by logic, by the ugly and alien logic of predestination. Poetry was not the disease, but the medicine. Poetry partly kept him in health. He could sometimes forget the red and thirsty hell to which his hideous necessitarianism dragged him among the wide waters and the white flat lilies of the ooze. He was damned by John Calvin. He was almost saved by John Gilpin. Everywhere we see that men do not go mad by dreaming. Critics are much madder than poets. Homer is complete and calm enough. It is his critics who tear him into extravagant tatters. Shakespeare is quite himself. It is only some of his critics who have discovered that he was somebody else. And though St. John the Evangelist saw many strange monsters in his vision, he saw no creature so wild as one of his own commentators. The general fact is simple. Poetry is sane because it floats easily in an infinite sea. Reason seeks to cross the infinite sea and so make it finite. The result is mental exhaustion, like the physical exhaustion of Mr. Holbein. 
To accept everything is an exercise, to understand everything a strain. The poet only desires exaltation and expansion, a world to stretch himself in. The poet only asks to get his head into the heavens. It is the logician who seeks to get the heavens into his head, and it is his head that splits. It is a small matter, but not irrelevant, that this striking mistake is commonly supported by a striking misquotation. We have all heard people cite the celebrated line of Dryden as, Great genius is to madness near allied. But Dryden did not say that great genius was to madness near allied. Dryden was a great genius himself, and knew better. It would have been hard to find a man more romantic than he, or more sensible. What Dryden said was this, Great wits are oft to madness near allied. And that is true. It is the pure promptitude of the intellect that is in peril of a breakdown. Also, people might remember of what sort of man Dryden was talking. He was not talking of any unworldly visionary like Vaughan or George Herbert. He was talking of a cynical man of the world, a skeptic, a diplomatist, a great practical politician. Such men are indeed to madness near allied. Their incessant calculation of their own brains and other people's brains is a dangerous trade. It is always perilous to the mind to reckon up the mind. A flippant person has asked why we say as mad as a hatter. A more flippant person might answer that a hatter is mad because he has to measure the human head. And if great reasoners were often maniacal, it is equally true that maniacs are commonly great reasoners. When I was engaged in a controversy with the clarion on a matter of free will, that able writer, Mr. R. B. Southers, said that free will was lunacy because it meant causeless actions, and the actions of a lunatic would be causeless. I do not dwell here upon the disastrous lapse in determinist logic, Obviously, if any actions, even a lunatic's, can be causeless, determinism is done for. If the chain of causation can be broken for a madman, it can be broken for a man. But my purpose is to point out something more practical. It was natural, perhaps, that a modern Marxian socialist should not know anything about free will. But it was certainly remarkable that a modern Marxian socialist should not know anything about lunatics. Mr. Southers evidently did not know anything about lunatics. The last thing that can be said of a lunatic is that his actions are causeless. If any human acts may loosely be called causeless, they are the minor acts of a healthy man, whistling as he walks, slashing the grass with a stick, kicking his heels or rubbing his hands. It is the happy man who does the useless things. The sick man is not strong enough to be idle. It is exactly such careless and causeless actions that the madman could never understand, for the madman, like the determinist, generally sees too much cause in everything. The madman could read a conspiratorial significance into those empty activities. He would think that the lopping of the grass was an attack on private property. He would think that the kicking of the heels was a signal to an accomplice. If the madman could for an instant become careless, he would become sane. Everyone who has had the misfortune to talk with people in the heart or on the edge of mental disorder knows that their most sinister quality is a horrible clarity of detail, a connecting of one thing with another in a map more elaborate than a maze. If you argue with a madman, it is extremely probable that you will get the worst of it, for in many ways his mind moves all the quicker for not being delayed by the things that go with good judgment. He is not hampered by a sense of humor, or by charity, or by the dumb certainties of experience. He is the more logical for losing certain sane affections. Indeed, the common phrase for insanity is in this respect a misleading one. The madman is not the man who has lost his reason. The madman is the man who has lost everything except his reason. The madman's explanation of a thing is always complete, and often, in a purely rational sense, satisfactory. Or, to speak more strictly, the insane explanation, if not conclusive, is at least unanswerable. This may be observed specially in the two or three commonest kinds of madness. If a man says, for instance, that men have a conspiracy against him, you cannot dispute it except by saying that all the men deny that they are conspirators, which is exactly what conspirators would do. His explanation covers the facts as much as yours. Or if a man says that he is the rightful king of England, it is no complete answer to say that the existing authorities call him mad, for if he were king of England, that might be the wisest thing for the existing authorities to do. Or if a man says that he is Jesus Christ, it is no answer to tell him that the world denies his divinity, 
for the world denied Christ's. Nevertheless, he is wrong, but if we attempt to trace his error in exact terms, we shall not find it quite so easy as we had supposed. Perhaps the nearest we can get to expressing it is to say this, that his mind moves in a perfect but narrow circle. A small circle is quite as infinite as a large circle, but though it is quite as infinite, it is not so large. In the same way, the insane explanation is quite as complete as the sane one, but it is not so large. A bullet is quite as round as the world, but it is not the world. There is such a thing as a narrow universality. There is such a thing as a small and cramped eternity. You may see it in many modern religions. Now, speaking quite externally and empirically, we may say that the strongest and most unmistakable mark of madness is this combination between a logical completeness and a spiritual contraction. The lunatic's theory explains a large number of things, but it does not explain them in a large way. I mean that if you or I were dealing with a mind that was growing morbid, we should be chiefly concerned not so much to give it arguments as to give it air, to convince it that there was something cleaner and cooler outside the suffocation of a single argument. Suppose, for instance, it were the first case that I took as typical. Suppose it were the case of a man who accused everybody of conspiring against him. If we could express our deepest feelings of protest and appeal against his obsession, I suppose we should say something like this. Oh, I admit that you have your case and have it by heart, and that many things do fit into other things as you say. I admit that your explanation contains a great deal, but what a great deal it leaves out. Are there no other stories in the world except yours, and are all men busy with your business? Suppose we grant the details. Perhaps when the man in the street did not seem to see you, it was only his cunning. Perhaps when the policeman asked you your name, it was only because he knew it already. But how much happier you would be if you only knew that these people cared nothing about you. How much larger your life would be if yourself could become smaller in it, if you could really look at other men with common curiosity and pleasure, if you could see them walking as they are in their sunny selfishness and their virile indifference. You would begin to be interested in them, because they are not interested in you. You would break out of this tiny and tawdry theatre in which your own little plot is always being played, and you would find yourself under a freer sky in a street full of splendid strangers. Or suppose it were the second case of madness, that of a man who claims the crown. Your impulse would be to answer, All right, perhaps you know that you are the King of England, but why do you care? Make one magnificent effort and you will be a human being and look down on all the kings of the earth. Or it might be the third case of the madman who calls himself Christ. If we said what we felt, we should say, So you are the creator and the redeemer of the world, but what a small world it must be. What a little heaven you must inhabit with angels no bigger than butterflies. How sad it must be to be God, and an inadequate God. Is there really no life fuller and no love more marvelous than yours? And is it really in your small and painful pity that all flesh must put its faith? How much happier you would be, how much more of you there would be, if the hammer of a higher god could smash your small cosmos, scattering the stars like spangles, and leave you in the open, free like other men to look up as well as down. And it must be remembered that the most purely practical science does take this view of mental evil. It does not seek to argue with it like a heresy, but simply to snap it like a spell. Neither modern science nor ancient religion believes in complete free thought. Theology rebukes certain thoughts by calling them blasphemous. Science rebukes certain thoughts by calling them morbid. For example, some religious societies discourage men more or less from thinking about sex. The new scientific society definitely discourages men from thinking about death. It is a fact but it is considered a morbid fact. And in dealing with those whose morbidity has a touch of mania, modern science cares far less for pure logic than a dancing dervish. In these cases it is not enough that the unhappy man should desire truth, he must desire health. Nothing can save him but a blind hunger for normality like that of a beast. A man cannot think himself out of mental evil, or it is actually the organ of thought that has become diseased, ungovernable, and as it were, independent. He can only be saved by will or faith. The moment his mere reason moves, it moves in the old circular rut. He will go round and round his logical circle, 
just as a man in a third-class carriage on the inner circle will go round and round the inner circle until he performs the voluntary, vigorous, and mystical act of getting out at Gower Street. Decision is the whole business here. A door must be shut forever. Every remedy is a desperate remedy. Every cure is a miraculous cure. Curing a madman is not arguing with a philosopher, it is casting out a devil. And however quietly doctors and psychologists may go to work in the matter, their attitude is profoundly intolerant, as intolerant as Bloody Mary. Their attitude is really this, that the man must stop thinking if he is to go on living. Their counsel is one of intellectual amputation. If thy head offend thee, cut it off, for it is better not merely to enter the kingdom of heaven as a child, but to enter it as an imbecile, rather than with your whole intellect to be cast into hell or into Hanwell. End of chapter 2, part 1